Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the many ways that You reveal Yourself. And what we ask, O oh God, is that You would reveal Yourself today through, through the means of ordinary words. Whether they're spoken, thought, or read, or even prayed. We pray, O oh God, that they would be enveloped by the power of Your Holy Spirit to do what You can only do. Convict us, O oh God, of our sin. And also, God, remind us of the great price that You paid to redeem us. For You, O oh God, are one who pursues, who chases after us, and redeems. And we give thanks for that today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Lisa and I went up to Pennsylvania over Thanksgiving. And I was sharing with somebody we, that even though we love to spend time with our family, we also love to put our feet under our own table again. When I was growing up, there was, uh, a, we had a, I had a friend who had horses. Anybody have horses or grow up riding horses or anything like that? Yeah. They're very dangerous critters. Um, and uh, we would go and prepare the horse for saddle and, you know, kind of brush it down and make sure there's no spurs or anything, put the saddle on. And we'd spend a good part of a morning, early afternoon riding. But as soon as those horses sent, uh, started to get the sense that we were headed back to the barn, woe wasn't good enough to stop that horse. He, he, that horse knew it was going back. When we were up there, as, lo, as, as beautiful as it was to be with family, the horses knew when we were headed home, and they were anxious to get there. Last year, we drove up and somewhere in between West Virginia at dark 30 in the morning, Katie just would not stop crying. Got out of the car, slammed... Now, this was last door before I met Jesus. <laughs> Got out of the car, slammed the door, said, I'm walking, Lisa, if you don't get that kid of yours quiet. And I started to walk. <laughs> I... <laughs> well, Jesus says that whatever we think about in our heart, don't we? <laughs> This time it went a lot better. We, we left at 4 in the morning to go up, and we were there around 7.30 at night. So it's a 15 and a half hours. So um, people, when, when they're awake, they don't listen a little bit to my rule that there are no potty breaks except at welcome areas in new states. And um, that just doesn't work. So coming home, we decided to leave at um, 5 o'clock at night in the afternoon. And we would drive all night. And we got home at 7.30 or 7 a.m. And it was blissful. <laughs> everybody asleep. Man, I wanted to give everybody an Ambien right at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Not that I promote that. But while we were up there, we did uh, go ice skating. Yeah, outside in Pittsburgh and uh, enjoyed our time there. And um, there's a John was a little bit of a Scrooge. He didn't want to go ice skating. But Katie did. Kate, yeah, Katie, three and a half years old. It's not a long, it's not a, a big rink. It's outside, big Christmas tree. It might take me and you to get around the circle in three minutes, two minutes. Katie put skates on. It took us 45 minutes to get her around once. <laughs> once. Halfway through, she looked at me and she said, Dad, you just taught me how to walk. Why are you putting me on ice? Can you believe that? Unbelievable. Um, but we had a good time with our family. There she is. Um, a little bit... Uh, mischievous there <laughs> both of them <laughs> and uh and this is a picture of Anna and I when um we were just sitting after Thanksgiving it was just a wonderful evening um so I hope you all had a great uh a holiday and a great time with family um but the tool 
tools or the bell tools for us to continue. And so we're going to go ahead and um, pick up in uh, the end of chapter 4 to prepare us to get into chapter 5. Um, and we will be done at 11.30 uh, today. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, little things to go through. I got to tell you, this study, um, these are just my notes on the first four chapters, uh, five chapters. And it, it has just been a wonderful book to study alongside you all, even though I've been in here only a couple times. Um, I've been doing this on we uh, Tuesdays at Spring Harbor also, and uh, they really have enjoyed it too. Um, up to this point, what has been one of your favorite things in Romans? What has been one of the things that has stuck to uh, your mind? Uh, I had a, a, a dad, as I was asking him if how his son is preparing for college last, this, this earlier this fall, and how they were, you know, they're driving him to school and they're dropping him off. And his comment back to me was, I hope some of the spaghetti sticks to the wall that, I've been, that mom and I have been teaching him. I think that's a great imagery. Um, what, has what spaghetti has stuck to the walls of your heart, your mind, your soul about Romans up to and maybe including Romans chapter 5? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's uh, that's a wonderful point. Becky mentioned that the the um, how we're all the same, whether you're born into it or you're grafted into it and adopted into the family of God. There, the one key element of it all is we need God. We need God. All of us. Anything else? I think of that same uh, idea that Becky was talking about, but with all the denominations of Christianity around the world, that we are all the same, because sometimes we seem really different, and we get to thinking that way. Yeah, and, and Gene, i got to tell you that uh, probably Satan's most powerful tool are the multiple factions the Christian church is in. We, we have denominations out the door. The, the number of denominations, and, and, and it's unfortunate that many of those denominations birthed because or because of uh, or through non-essential theological understandings. Whether you should have a drum set in the sanctuary or not, well, I'm just going to go. Whether or not you should um, wear shorts or uh, uh, pants or whatnot, you know, we might have some feelings about that. But they get, those seem light, but they get a little heavier too when it comes to should we baptize children or adults? Should we sprinkle? Should we submerse when we baptize? Or should we put a slip and slide down the center aisle and just roll them down the center aisle? So there's, there's a lot of things that have divided us. And because we have been divided, it has weakened our solidarity. Um, yeah. Anyone else? So as we move into the end of chapter 4, I just want to remind you, which everybody has remembered since the last time I, I, I taught you all, was that there have been some major sections in Romans. You have Romans 1, 1 through uh, uh, 17. And, and remember at, at verse 15, what Paul says is he says, I am compelled to preach to you. And, and he's very intentional. He's never met this church. He's very intentional to get them to like him. And so he'll, he'll take logical, very uh, uh, intentional rhetorical means to unfold his argument. Getting to the point at 15 where he says, I'm compelled to preach. 
this gospel, this good news, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of all people, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And Becky, right there, the Jewish readers were caught off guard and put on edge when they heard, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Salvation of everybody, first for the Jew, I got that part, that's great. Then for the Gentile, uh uh-uh. So he kind of sprinkled a little bit of, uh, of what he's going to say on this, this, uh, this uh, introduction that gets them prepared for his arguments to unfold. And verse 17, for in it, the antecedent of it is gospel, for in this gospel, which is the power of God for the salvation of all people, which I am compelled to preach. See how everything is logically kind of stepping down. For in it, the righteousness of God is unveiled or revealed. The same Greek word that we get apocalypse from, unveiling. This apocalypse happens when, when the gospel is introduced through the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and in that revelation, righteousness of God is revealed. Righteousness. Now, the, the basic understanding of righteousness has always been a negative one. That the righteousness was going, to re, was going to result. The logical trajectory of righteousness was going to be wrath of God. And so at verse 18, he stops and has this little interlude, okay? All the way, 118 to 425. He has this little interlude where he is explaining what this wrath of God is. And he explains that it's for the Gentiles. And then in chapter 2, he, he says, but you are not without excuse. And then he digs down more and talks about this boasting, that, that this is a gift of God. You can't earn this. If you could earn it, then you would deserve it. But since you don't deserve it, you can't earn it. You know. And so he goes through and battles this Jewish understanding that this salvation, this covenantal relationship with God is not just for the Jewish people, but it is for the Gentile people, uh, but it's for the Jewish people also. And so there is this movement of internal reflection that's assumed that when, God, when Paul starts in 7, uh, 118 and says, this is the wrath of God, every one of them were on the edge of their seat. They had bought front row seats to this show to watch God reveal and God to uh, dole out His wrath on the Gentiles. And they were, yeah, go God. They all had their little flags and their ones and they were cheering, yeah, go God. And then there was this shift that not only they deserve it, but you deserve it too. Now we're going to come to this end part here because at the in, in uh, chapter uh, end of chapter three, middle of three to through four, he uses a case study of Abraham. Okay, and we'll we'll get into that. But at the end of four, five one picks up from where he left off way back here. And we'll get to that in just a second, so hang in there. So I want to kind of end what's going on in chapter 4, just to bring us to the same page that we move into chapter 5. Now the the emphasis on this section of text, starting in verse 9, the emphasis of this text is on a timeline of events that was going on, a uh, timeline of events in Abraham's life. And so as you look at this, he starts in verse 9. He says, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Now remember, what the circumcision was for was this outward show, this outward sign of, of their obedience or their place in God's family. Okay, this is what the Jewish people used as an outward sign. This is how they determined whether a man was a Jew or a Gentile. This is this was the outward. So everything was hinged. And because somebody was circumcised, 
it was entrance, it was a, they believed it was a guaranteed entrance into the covenantal blessing of God or relationship with God. So is this blessing then only for the circumcised, this blessing of God reaching out to save the Gentiles too? Or is it for the uncircumcised? For, if we, for we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. That goes all the way back to Genesis. It goes all the way back to there. That this faith, what is faith? Faith? Yes, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the, the uh, proof of what we don't see, the evidence of what is to come or what we hope for. Okay? It is something that's out there. Uh, and, and, uh, there's, there's, and hope is very powerful. So if, if faith results or generates a hope, then if we want hope, we have to go back to who are we putting our trust? What are we trusting in? It, hope is very powerful, so then faith is also. How then was it counted to him? How was this righteousness? Remember, righteousness is this right relationship with God. Then how was it, back to this, how was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Now we know. But he's making a logical argument to say to the point where it is not about your circumcision. This is, this, this, it's, it's about your faith, your trust in God. How then was it counted? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Of course, it's a rhetorical question. He answers it. It was not after, but it was before. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So what role then does uh, Abraham's circumcision play since it did not factor into this righteousness? And Paul provides this answer in verse 11. He says, circumcision never figured into this righteousness. Circumcision never figured in. It was never a part of God's plan to, uh, to bring this person into righteousness or justification. But rather, it is a sign. It is a seal of what has already been obtained by faith. Now think of this for a second. This past Sunday, we had a baptism. Okay? Now a baptism... And this is still fresh, even though it's been about seven or eight years. It's still fresh on my mind when I was writing some of my ordination papers, when we had to talk about the sacraments. What is the, what is the significance of the sacraments? Of course, we, uh, we have two sacraments, Holy Communion and Baptism. Holy Communion we will do every week or as often as possible. Baptism happens just once. Now, what comes first in the timeline of baptism. Do we baptize the child and then ask the parents if they have faith? Do we baptize the child and then ask the congregation to vow to walk alongside? No, we ask those vows first because what we want to do is have this vow, this faith, this trust in that God will do something in this child through us if he chooses to allow us to participate that is far beyond our understanding and so what we do is we define baptism as an outward sign of an inward spiritual grace and so that's what circumcision is for them. that's what paul is making circumcision be Circumcision is just an outward sign that is a response to the faith that Abraham had. So why then are you elevating this circumcision? Why are you putting it into a realm that it was never meant to have? It is a seal of what already had been obtained and by faith. 
And so, as this unfolds, Paul is making this, this argument that Abraham, as his case study, had been declared righteous because of his belief in God. And Paul describes circumcision as a state that by, himself, by itself is not sufficient to qualify people as descendants. John, excuse me. Yes. Did you say baptism was an outward sign? Of an inward spiritual grace. Yeah. Outward sign of an inward spiritual grace. Now, as, 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 we, as we think about this, um, this, this state of, of circumcision, that it is not by itself sufficient to qualify people as descendants, let's think now 2,000 years later in our vernacular and, and, and kind of unfold if there are some similarities where we put an emphasis on a religious act over a faith and a trust in God. Think about, uh, um, a com- I think about a conversation that I don't have just once or twice, but they seem to pop up once in a while, quite often sometimes, where someone would share with me their, a story about their grandchildren or great-grandchildren, and, and they would unfold with, to me this, uh, this state that they're in and say, boy, I just wish they would go to church. Just, they just got to go to church. Or my mom, as, as uh, many uh, have heard before, she, she is, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this in the sense of, of, of belief, but there's an emphasis on a certain way or what to believe about church or how we worship or how much preachers should get paid. I mean, I don't know, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, you know, it's as if these become determining factors of going to heaven or hell. Um, and, and, and so we, we, we look at the, the different ways that, um, that we sometimes put an emphasis on a practice. I went to a Christian school from third grade through 10th grade. I was paddled twice. And I was threatened to be paddled three times. But that's beside the point. And, uh, but I, I actually rode the bus with a PK. You know what a PK is? A preacher's kid. Yeah, a preacher's kid. They are bad. Stay away from my kids, seriously. Do not let your sons and daughters date my son and daughter. I mean, it's just, it's, I'm just teasing. Um, but but the, the idea was that... Um, that uh, the con- well, the conversation, or what he believed was, I will go to God and, and, and become a Christian on my deathbed. There's no sense of me being a Christian now. Why? And I'm willing to mitigate the risk myself. Why? This, this understanding that that act of asking Jesus into my heart Gives my golden t- gets my gold gives gives me my golden ticket of entrance. There's a little bit more involved in this response. It's not an act, and, and we're going to talk about this in just a second as we unfold this. And so this this uh, passage is is Paul trying to share with the uh, his readers that it is not about. Um, th- what they do, their sign, what their circumcision state is, it's their faith that qualifies them, nothing else. And it's an uncircumcised faith. And now that's something we might not use, but it's just m- a matter of chronologically placing the faith entrance into the life when it, when it happened. It was before the circumcision in their life. It's a kind of... Uh, uh, the kind that Abraham had, then that it was credited to him, and Paul's audience is likely uh, had likely treated this circumcision as a part of 
their justification or their relationship, to give them favor in God's eyes. And this belief was the motivation for Jewish believers who wanted Gentile believers to adopt Jewish behaviors. Do you remember that? Do you remember that passage? It's called the Jerusalem Council. It happens in Acts 15. And this letter goes, they're getting all worried that these Gentiles are joining the church and they are not practicing the law, let alone circumcision, but they're eating foods that have been, you know, uh, sacrificed to idols. They're meeting with people who they would not cross the street necessarily to meet or the normal Jewish person wouldn't at first century A.D., and, and so this Jerusalem council came to the conclusion that they said, let's not make it difficult for anyone to come to Jesus. Oh, wouldn't that be a great motto? Where have you and I made it difficult for somebody to come to Jesus? And where have we practiced difficulty in our faith? Where when other people watch, it makes it difficult for them to come to Jesus. I had a neighbor who was in Florida, a single woman, and she was a little girl. She was a painter, and I was trying to, we became kind of friends, and so I asked her back on the church, and her thought was she couldn't go to church because she didn't have the proper clothes to wear. And I tried to convince her that that was not even an issue, but I guess from what she had yeah, it was. I mean, I, I look at um, Katie, and, and Katie is three and three quarters now. She'll be four. Can you believe four years? Wow. I got gray hair. Okay. Um, Katie, you, you know how she prays? She, said, she prays the blessing, God our Father, God our Father, we thank you, we thank you. She has to repeat it. Four many blessings, four many blessings, amen, amen. And then, after she's done, she looks up. Oh, she's been looking the whole time, I'm telling you. And she says, yay. Now, I'd like to think, I, I, it's probably that she's ready to eat and she's all happy about eating, yay. But I'd like to think that the yay after the amen is her way of saying, I give this to God. It's no longer my job. And I don't do that. Because after I say amen, inside, how many of you are like this? We still think it's our problem. We still think. We still want to give God. God, I, I know you are capable of doing this. But let me help you in case you didn't know how to do this. You see, faith is, is um, th there are a lot of things that stand in the way of answered prayer. And sometimes it is the way we expect God to answer the prayer that stands in the way the most. Because we come to God and we say, okay, God, you did it this way in the past. We're not sure what happened in this way, but as we're praying for similar, a similar situation, we want you to do what you did back here, and this is what we're going to claim, and we're actually going to say in Jesus' name, because the Bible says that whatever you ask in Jesus' name, and we're going to gather maybe two or more with us, and so we'll all say in Jesus' name as if this is a magical mantra. And what we do is we wait with expectation, and yet at the same time, anxiety and frustration when things sometimes don't go the way we expected. And so there's this, this, when it comes to this faith, sometimes we pray and at the same time we have doubtful expectation where we say, God, I am giving this to you. Here's the problem. I don't know what to do. And I don't think you do either. Now, now, you chuckle a second, because you might have heard somebody do that. And you might cringe a little bit, because you might remember when you did that. Look, there's nothing wrong with that. God, God is, God's going to do what God's going to do. Is that fair to say? 
it's not as if you have a little bit of doubt and that, that, okay, here, it's your fault. It's all going to, no. You see, praying and living with faith, like Abraham, believing the impossible, gives us this, uh, this notion, this ability to live in peace. Doesn't it? I mean, what is the benefit of, of, of this unwavering faith in God? What is the benefit? Because we know it goes up and down. We see it in the biblical lives of the characters whose lives unfold on the pages of Scripture. What is the benefit other than the fact of us being able to sleep at night? To be able, when we are bombarded by the emotion, to be able to say, God, this is your problem. Or when we're reminded of the shame of sin in the past, to not focus on the shame or the sin that we did, but to focus, let that to be a trigger or a catalyst for us to focus on the forgiveness. God, I'm feeling this way, I'm remembering this, and I'm very thankful that you've already forgiven me for this. There might be conviction of unconfessed sin, but God never condemns confessed sin. You know how I know that? Romans 8.1 Now, therefore, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Now, you can't understand what the therefore means until we get this whole story that we're going to see unfold in verse f- uh, chapter 5. But this unfolds in such a way that it gives us an invitation into a peace with God and it allows us to see and believe that God is bigger than our problems. Uh, the, uh, there's a wonderful kids program called the Veggie Tales. Yeah? Um, we, when Aunt, Katie and I think Anna also started to talk, they would call it ve- uh, um, vegetables. Vegetables. It's vegetables, right? All right, vegetables. Uh, we uh, growing up. I mean, you know, looking at this show and earlier, and we we thought this was the media's way to encourage kids to eat their vegetables because it's not called the fruit tails or the Twix bars or Snickers tails, but it's the veggie tails. So um, they have this one, and they're Christian, and they're on Netflix, and they're on our Right Now Media also. But there's one that's a, that's about this little asparagus that is scared at night and so Bob the tomato comes in and reminds the little asparagus junior that God is bigger than the boogeyman God is bigger than the boogeyman and I think that's important I do you see because as Paul writes about these things and he talks about the faith of Abraham. We are invited into a place where God says you don't have to live wondering. You don't have to. Let me um, share before our break this and then we'll take a short break and then get right back into it. Um, this is a, uh, an excerpt from Max Lucado's book, Anybody ever read Max Lucado? Max Lucado is just, he's a wonderful writer, uh, you know. Uh, it, it is from a book called Come Thirsty. I love that. It's, it's, and it's based off of an Isaiah passage, I think. But he, um, he starts with, the, he, he begins chapter 15 with this little story that I just want to share with you. And then remember, this is all around um, trusting that God is in the midst And God still loves. He writes, Nine-year-old Al trudges through the London streets. His hand is squeezing a note. His heart is pounding with fear. He's not read the letter. His father forbade him from doing so. He doesn't know the message, but he knows its destination, the police station. Young boys might covet a trip to the police station, not Al. At least, not today. Punishment, not pleasure, spawned his visit. 
Al failed to meet the father's curfew. The fun of the day made him forget the time of the day, and he came home late, and he came home in trouble. His father, a stern disciplinarian, met Al at the front door, and with no greeting gave him a note and the instruction, take it to the jailhouse. Al has no idea what to expect, but he fears the worst. The fears prove justifiable. The officer, a friend of his father, opens the note, reads it aloud, reads it, and nods, follow me, to little Al. And he leads the wide-eyed youngster to a jail cell. He opens the door and tells him to enter, and the officer clangs the door shut. This is the way, this is what we do to naughty boys, he explained, and he walks away. Al's face pales as he draws the only possible conclusion. Now listen, this is what we do in our faith. We've messed up. Time had gotten the best of us. We think God more of a disciplinarian than of a father. He only comes to the, he draws the only possible conclusion. He has crossed his father's line. He has exhausted his supply of grace. He has outspent the cash of mercy. And so his dad has locked him away. And young Al has no reason to think he'll ever see his family again. And he was wrong. The jail sentence only lasted five minutes. But those five minutes felt like five months. And Al never forgot that day. The, so the sound of the clanging door he often told people, stayed with him the rest of his life. Its echo wordlessly announced, your father rejects you. Search all you want, he isn't here. Plead all you want, he won't hear. You are separated from your father's love. And that slamming of the cell door, many fear they have heard it. Now forgot, Al forgot the curfew. You forgot the virtue. Little Al came home late. Maybe you came home uh, in, a, in a stupor. All or didn't come home at all. Al lost track of, of time. You lost your sense of direction and ended up in the wrong place. And the, what, we are, uh, what we live into is we are locked away, not by an earthly father, but by a heavenly one. We're incarcerated, not in a Brit British cell, but in the personal guilt shame. And no need to request mercy. The account is empty. Make no appeal for grace. The check will bounce. You've gone too far. Don't we do that? Don't we do that sometimes? And this is the picture that had been characterized in Jewish history for so long that prevented him to see, from seeing a grace, a gift of God. Now before we, when we come back, we'll pick up where we left off and, and get into chapter 5 and we'll continue building off of this foundation. Let's take a eight and a half minute break. <laughs>
Ladies, these last 40 minutes together, we're going to uh, um, work through what uh, I had planned. But uh, if, if we need to sit and park somewhere, don't hesitate to, uh, to stop and ask questions. Um, and we can go from there. So what we have is Paul's case study here about Abraham and where he ends in the middle of chapter 4 is that Abraham had this faith and this faith was declared to him or was credited to him as righteousness before he even partook or in that outward sign called baptism. And in verse 18 what Paul does is he begins to explain a little bit more about what this faith uh, completely uh, looked like. And, and a little bit from, from Abraham's perspective. And I, and I love this. this. This phrase right here at the beginning of chapter four, verse 18 in chapter 4, in hope he believed against hope. Let, let that sink in for just a second. In hope, yeah. He believed against hope. Hoping against hope. Uh, this is, um, uh, th- this, this is, uh, uh, I love the Greek in here. I'm not going to, I actually take the time, but the words that are used in here, nouns, verbs, the roots. Um, elpis is the Greek word for uh, uh, faith, which is um, a noun. And then there's, I'm sorry, for hope as a noun, or hope as a verb has another uh, word. And then belief, pistis, is a word that we get, our, um, uh, f- we get faith from or trust. Um, or believe, all of these things are so intricately woven. In hope, he believed against hope. And I, and, and I think we all do this at times. Been married 25 years this coming May. Yeah, I can see everybody, you know, saying, well, Lisa's a saint. Um, in, in, in over those 25 years, unfortunately, Lisa has learned something about me that I'm not very proud of. That sometimes, not very many times, but sometimes, she'll ask me to do something. And as she asks me, you can tell in her eyes that she knows I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Have you ever asked somebody to do something? And you knew they weren't going to do it? This morning. This morning. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, uh, so I, think, I think this is what Paul is saying about Abraham. That there is hope that God will do something. And he's hopeful that God will do it. Hopeful. There is this hope. What's the hope for Abraham? Well, great nation. All the people will be blessed because of him through his lineage. The problem is he had no ability to put hope in his own ability. Because he was... You wonder, why did God wait till Abraham was a hundred years old to give him a kid. And that there was, that his wife Sarah was barren, which literally in the Hebrew means death. Don't worry, they'll get it. So why is that? Why did God wait until Abraham was a hundred? So that, 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 that there would be no question that it was God's work. Isn't that the truth? I mean, how many times do we trust God with the easy things? 
And we have trouble trusting God with the impossible things. Why is that? I mean, that is, that is so hu- that is so, so, so much a part of our human nature. That, that we actually trust God with the easy things. God, I really need a parking spot. But we don't lose any sleep if we don't get a good parking spot, right? Where we lose sleep. Where we haven't given God the impossible. And God loves to show up in the impossible, doesn't He? He, he does this, and, and, and it's an invitation that, um, that He gives in, in uh, the Psalms, where He says, and I wrote down this passage, because I always forget if it's Psalm 36.8, or 38.4, or 38.6. It's right in the early 30s, or late 30s, or beginning of the chapter. But He says, taste and see that I am Good. Why does he say taste? I can look at my mom's cherry pie and I know that it's good. It's when I taste it that I know it's really good. Right? 34.8. Thank you. It is is an invitation. Oh my goodness, friends, listen. This is exciting. You know why? Because God is inviting you and me to, to, to participate in His goodness. He's inviting us. He's saying, come. Oh, we can't do that. We'd be testing God. We'd be manipulating God, wouldn't we? Wouldn't, wouldn't we? God's, the Bible says we shouldn't test God. No. It's an invitation. Let, let me, um, let me uh, throw up a couple verses here on uh, our passage, or on a couple passages, okay? The first one is um, Ephesians. And you can write these down, or you can uh, look at them with me on this. Um, Ephesians, uh, chapter 3. At at this pivotal point in the book of Ephesians, where he moves from a, a theme of chapters 1, 2, and 3 to a theme of 4, 5, and 6. The first three chapters of Ephesians are centered around all the, the blessed rich grace, the richness of God's grace, the, what God, his good, the bounty that he has. It begins that he has blessed you with all the spiritual blessings. He has, he has already uh, brought you in and, and called you into a different state, a different being, a different family tree. And at the end, Paul uh, says, Now, to him who is able. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. You can put down here Romans 8, where I think it's in uh, 26 or near there, 36, um, where Paul says, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. According to the power that's worked with it, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Or, 1 John 4.4, 4, where he says, Little children, you, have, you are from God, and you have overcome them. You can read the book of 1 John to find out the context of who them is. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Or you have this, this passage in John chapter 1, verse 14, that says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as, the, as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and, and let, me, let me just park here for just a second, because what Abraham di- does, 
What matters to God is, is, is this unwavering faith in something that makes little sense to us. Believing that God is not only will, able, but to believe that God is willing to accomplish what He has promised. And this reliance upon God, this faith that God is both willing and able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine or even hope for, to ask or think that this reliance is not some new development, that this started way back in Old Testament scriptures. This has been God's plan from the beginning. This full of grace and truth, this is, this is that tension that Jesus has inside that, uh, that lives into, this characteristic that Jesus lives into, that gives at the moment what we need most, both grace and truth, like he does to the woman who was accused of adultery. Where are your accusers? They're all gone. Neither do I accuse you. That's grace. But at the same time, truth, go and sin no more. It's this belief that God says to you, even if I don't, even that God, it's the belief that God says to you, you are my child. I am yours. You are mine. Grace. And then at the same time, this truth, if I don't answer your prayers like you want them, is that going to be okay for you? That's truth. It's that combination of that grace and truth that we live into that Paul says throughout the rest of the chapter gives us hope. And we then find ourselves hoping and boasting. If you go all the way back to chapter 2s and 3s, you'll find this boasting. Boasting in our afflictions. As James would say in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, which is if you're looking for great passages to memorize, great passages to memorize is James 1, 2, and 3. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For, now anytime you see for, it is a explanation. He's going to substantiate this, this, uh, or, um, uh, I'm sorry, he, it, it's, ca it's causation. He, he, he's given you the effect of the statement, the truth. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. A quality that the Old Testament reserved for God alone. But now you can have too. Count is a Greek word that's used in athletic competitions that means keep score what do you mean keep score keep score every time something bad happens mm -hmm. why because the more times you trust God with the impossible the more you can trust God in the future impossibilities Christians don't like to talk about money but money and time are the two things that we have surrendered ground on. Our time and our money. Now when we talk about money, the reason, I, the reason and I love the way Shane says this, the reason why we don't ever come out and say, well, you should give 10% or 15% or 6% is because that's, that's not, that, that becomes a law more than an act of faith. What he says is you should go one step beyond comfortable. Why? Because it's in those moments where we can trust God. It's in those moments that we trust God. And it's just not money. You think about raising kids. When they become teenagers and they're about to go off to school and you think, have I done enough? Have I taught them everything they need to know? And be able to go and say, I trust. I've done what I can, even though I haven't been perfect. 
done what I can, God. You got to pick up the slack. I trust you to do the impossible. And that's where he ends this little interlude. And if we go back to Romans chapter 5, you begin to see where he goes from there. He starts with this word, therefore. Based on everything I've said from 118 through 425, this is now how you should think. Since we have been justified by faith. I mean, what is the, uh, what is the common, understand, or common response? Since we have been justified by going to church every Sunday. Since we have been justified by giving, serving, letting people out in traffic, even though I might not get the friendly wave. The thank you wave. Oh, that just irks me. I'm sorry. Back down. Okay. Even since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And then he emphasizes this once more. Through. Even if you didn't get it here, you'll get it here. It's through the instrument or through the agent or through the means of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through him, Jesus, that we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of glory of God. The emphasis here is not on the having been reconciled or justified. It is on that peace. The emphasis is on the peace. Now, uh, mine says uh, justified right here. What do your Bibles use? What word? Justified. Justified. Anybody else have a different word other than justified? Made Made right. Anybody have reconciled? Somebody? Those are all appropriate words that can be used. What's your uh, definition of justified? Make right. All right. Make right. Yeah, anybody ever use uh, Microsoft Word? Yeah, you, if it's left justified, all the lines on the left side are made right. <laughs> yeah, and they're lined up. If it's right justified, no matter what the left looks like, That's my OCD right there. Okay. And they're made right. If it's full justified, they match. They match. This, notice the, the, the term. It's having, the, the term here, since, which is, okay, This has happened in the past. We have been justified. Since we have... What else could he have said? Since we are justified, right? He could have said that. Since we were justified, right? All those are... You could have said those words. He says, since we have been justified. That help, any, any grammar, English, like, like English verbs and stuff like that? I, I never really liked. We had in seventh grade this small English grammar book, and it was like this thick. I mean, it was just about this big, but 
halfway in the beginning of that book, you would start diagramming sentences. I just hated diagramming sentences. Oh. Look, I, uh, look my, I, I wish I did like it. I, I, I wish I did at that time like it. Um, I, when I started taking foreign language and, and Greek and Hebrew, we, we had to diagram Greek. Now it's, I, I do it so much in that area that you know, it's really affected the way that I communicate with people, especially in my family. My, my children will, will constantly push back on what I'm saying, and, or, or I'll push back on what they're saying. I said, now, what I heard you say is this. See, the object of that verb is this, and, and the indirect object is here, and, and, and you know, what you're saying, you seem to be communicating. They said, Dad, stop. You know, it's just... I become a lot more analytical, unfortunately. Having been, it, if I would say to you, come, let's have lunch together. And you said to me, no thank you. I had a big breakfast. Not, I ate breakfast. Because that would be idiotic, right? Well, I'm not asking you to breakfast, I'm asking you to lunch. I, don't, and I, I ate breakfast. No, thank you. I don't want to go to lunch with you. I, just, I, I ate breakfast. <laughs> no. I, had, I just had breakfast, or I had a big breakfast. When I put that helping verb in there, it changes the scope of the word. It, the action still happened in the past, but what I'm saying is I'm still living into its effects. In other words, I'm still living into, right now, the result of that breakfast. That, that's what I'm saying to you, okay? Or you're saying back to me, no, I don't want to have lunch with you. I had a big breakfast. You're saying, I'm still living into the effects. It happened in the past, but I'm still living into the effect. G when we say, Jesus has risen from the dead, not Jesus died and rose from the dead, but when he said Jesus have, has risen, which is in our liturgy of the great thanksgiving, what are we saying? It's not just a one time, but we are living into the effects of that. So let me illustrate this a little bit further on, in detail with our passage. You have a status. You have a, let me look at my notes here, make sure I get these columns right. You have a prospect, and you have a change agent, okay? Everybody starts as an enemy to God. Everybody, Jew, Gentile, starts as an enemy. The prospect is, for enemies, is the wrath of God. That's what everybody deserves. If you go and look at Romans 6.23, well, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Now, isn't it interesting that he uses the word wage? I mean... We might think of it as nothing, but if you think of it the context when he has just spent so much time telling these Jewish readers, you shouldn't boast about your circumcision. You shouldn't boast about what you can do. You shouldn't boast that you are better than the Gentiles. You shouldn't boast. Why? You boast about things you deserve and have earned. You never really boast about gifts. In the idea of gifts, you boast about the giver. He says here, you, for the wages of sin, the most you can earn because of this state, the most you can earn from your current state of sin is wrath or death. You can go to church, teach Sunday school, be baptized 19 million times. You can serve at soup kitchens, but the most you deserve 
The most you can earn is death. And the reason he does is not to put a damper on what we do, but to get our perspective right that the gift has been given and the things that we do is a response to the giver who has given the gift. So, enemy of God is our status. The prospect is the wrath of God. The change agent is the cross. The death of Jesus, isn't it? That's what changed people's state from being an enemy of God to being something else. To deserving the wrath of God, but receiving something else. And so here, the second state is now you are declared righteous. It is a legal term. You can be you can still feel unrighteous, undeserving at the same time as receiving righteousness. You see what I'm saying? You might think you don't deserve it, but it doesn't matter what you des- you think you deserve. It is a legal term. Justification is a legal term. You have been declared. You haven't declared yourself. That's called self-righteous. And we all know self-righteous people, don't we? Yeah. We know. They look what I deserve. But this, the de- declaration of justification is a legal term that God says to you and me, that this is the new state. Later on in chapter uh, six, seven, six and seven, even later or later in five, all of five, six and seven, great chapters. He'll talk about this combination of being this difference of being you once were in Adam, but now you are in Christ. You, you read that far? You, you you know what I'm talking about? At one time you were in Adam. But now you are in Christ. Once you were an enemy, but now you are declared righteous. And this declaration of a righteousness is a, an edict. It is a judge sitting on his bench declaring a sentence of not guilty. Whether you deserved it or not. This is that in Adam, in Christ mentality. So it is possible, using that imagery of in Adam, in Christ, it is possible for you and me to be in Christ. When you become a Christian, you are no longer, you are moved from being in Adam and put it to be in Christ. It's a legal action. It just happens. But it is possible to be in Christ and still think you're in Adam. It's still possible to be declared righteous and think you're an enemy. It's still possible because it has nothing to do with the way we think. It is now, going back to Abraham, a belief in the impossible. What did God, what did Jesus say to the disciples in Luke when they asked after the rich young ruler came? Well, then who can be saved? With God, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Isn't that beautiful? So you have this declared righteousness. The prospect is salvation. And the change agent is Jesus' life. So you have the cross... Is the change agent that moves us from enemies and deserving the wrath to declared righteous. But the salvation, now that you are having been this one time, we're still living into the effects. It's just not a notch on my belt. It's something I did that actually seeps into the fabric of every other part of my life. I have been declared righteous. I have salvation. And the change agent is the way Jesus lived. And lives now. That's that's. Does that make sense? How 
Self-righteous says, I don't, uh, well, no, let me back up. You think of it as if, if, if Lisa and I, has anybody had a family member that has adopted a child? Yeah. If, if Lisa and I went over to Ukraine and we adopted a child, the best imagery is we go through all the paperwork, we grease the palms that are necessary, and we come back with a child. What happens in that adoption is the state or the government of Ukraine says that this child is no longer a citizen or part of, no longer does not have a, ch a parent, but now has a parent. No longer under our authority, but lives under the authority of John and Lisa. And that child lives in our house for so long, and then at one point that child gets to an age where there's a knock at the door. And the child goes to the, the, the door and opens up, and there is the, uh, the leader of the orphanage that he or she grew up in. What do you think is the first thing that that child will experience? Fear. Fear. Why? I have to go back. But so, so this declared righteousness that you ask about, Slade, is the same of going back to that child, or at least the parents, and saying to that leader, that worker in that orphanage, and saying, you have no authority. Why? Is it anything that that child has done? No. So that takes out self-righteous. Self-righteous promotes what I'm owed, what I'm due, what I've earned. And the most that you and I can earn is death. That's it. Righteous, or the de declaration of righteousness or justification that is imputed upon us is, um, is, is something that is true even though we, believe, that we may not believe it's true. It's a reality even though we might think it is a dream. Okay? So now talk about your faith journey. Talk about your prayers. How much, how many times do we find ourselves praying, believing we're still in Adam? God, I've exhausted all of my grace. I know that there's probably no more forgiveness, no more love. You've done enough, but please, would you do it one more time? Hmm. See, that, that's praying from in Adam. But praying, it's praying as an enemy. Can, can, can I convince you? Can I twist your arm? Is there something I can do to earn this favor? Praying as a, declare, as a declared justified person or righteous person or as someone who's in Christ is someone who says, God, you're my heavenly father and I know you are with me. That I'm yours and you are mine. Walk alongside of me as you have and that you promised to do. You see where it lands? Is it's believing that God is who he says he is. It's believing what God says about himself to be true. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And believe it. When as temptations come in to say, yeah, God's left you. No, 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 no. He hasn't. And here's the passage of scripture that I will use. Before Thanksgiving, I had a, um, a, a rough time being nice to people. You probably never have done that before. Uh, and I, you know... A friend of mine once said, and I, I sometimes say it tongue-in-cheek, church is a lot of fun if there were no people involved. <laughs> yeah, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Thank you. I got a little frustrated with some of the things that I was doing and the, some of the, 
it just got a little on. Maybe the horse was looking to go to the barn. My barn was Pennsylvania, and maybe I just was kind of hanging on. And I came across a passage that I've started to memorize. And I think memorizing scripture, friends, is the best thing you can do in your spiritual journey. Memorize, memorize, memorize scripture, word for word. Know where you get it from. Know it. And one, the passage that, the most recent passage that I memorized was um, Psalm 8410. Every preacher should memorize this. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Okay? For a day at your church is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Psalm 8410. Do you know what that was saying? Even if I get to open the door for people as they walk in the door, that's good enough for me. So why are you frustrated about what you get to do so much more? So you know what happens when I get frustrated about remembering where I was a couple weeks ago? As I say, you know, for a day in your house, or in your, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You know what? In 30 seconds, it might come back again. For I'd rather be, I would rather be a doorkeeper. I would rather be a doorkeeper. I would rather be a doorkeeper. Would you say that was 8410. Psalm 8410. That's it. Now, here... In 5, 6, and 7 is a little interlude, interlude as I take, bring this to a conclusion. It's a little interlude. The interlude is uh, picked up again in chapter 8. Okay? F the rest of 5, 6, and 7 is going to talk about sin and how sin came to be. Um, I preached a sermon once based off a, a title of a chapter that Ellsworth Callis wrote in a book called Easter from the Backside. It was a wonderful book, but the chapter was, if Easter's the answer, what's the question? You ever see the bumper sticker that says Jesus is the answer? Have you ever asked, I wonder what the question is? Now you might think, oh, I'm doubtful, I'm fearful, I'm anxious. Jesus is the answer. Now that's not really what Jesus is the answer for because... Jesus is the answer to this. Now, as you live out your declared righteousness, Jesus is the answer to your hope and glory, even if it does not turn out the way you want. Jesus is the answer, yeah. What's the question? The question is sin. Sin is the question. What do we do with sin. That starts all the way back in Genesis 3. And after Genesis 3, we see, or in the, in the margins of Genesis 3, we see a God who is pursuing. Where are you, Adam? No one said, oh, I'm right here. God, psst, come over here. No, God said, where are you? Pursues. And he redeems. Speaks about that messianic prophecy in verse 15 of chapter 3. For his heel will crush, for the heel of your seed, the seed, your seed's heel will crush the head of the serpent. That's that first messianic prophecy of hope. Of what has separated us will redeem us. Bring us back. Okay? And so, but starting in five, there is this obituary that goes over and over again, this, um, uh, the, there, there's this uh, recitation about our human history that, that death notices have this monotonous beat in chapter 5 of Genesis. Each gives us a name of the person, how long they lived until the birth of their first son, then the report of how many more years he lived bearing other sons and daughters, and always concluding with these words, and he died. Boom. He lived, son, Sons and daughters live this long, long, 
and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It's a drumbeat. The result of sin, death. Result of sin, death. And he died except for one person. Enoch. It's just a little blip. It's an interruption into this monotonous drumbeat of death notices. For Enoch, he walked with God, and he was no more. For God took him. You look for the glimpses of grace in your world of death, and they will become for you expressions of a God who loves you. Look past the death tolls and the notices and the monotonous drumbeat of life playing out in a minor tune. And notice those glimpses of grace where God reveals himself. God never promised to explain himself. He's okay with the why question. But don't ever expect an answer. Do you know what he does promise to do? He just promises to reveal himself. And what difference would that make in your days to come? In the next five days, what difference would that make if you looked for their glimpses of grace and they became catalysts a catalyst for you to have unwavering faith and trust in a God who has already declared you righteous. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, we ask that you would go before us. As Moses asks in uh, Exodus 33, when you send the people of Israel out of camp, he says, he asks, don't send us unless you go before us. And so we pray that you would do just that, that you would go before us, that you would line the highways, the paths, and the relationships, the interactions with our world, with your most intimidating angels. Revealing yourself and giving us opportunities to have the courage to recognize that you will do the impossible. It's in your name we pray. Amen.